And now we cross over to our Oh Siang for Global Insight and an in that look at important developments in world affairs. Thanks, Mo Gyeong. It is indeed time for Global Insight, where we speak to experts from around the world on issues making headlines. After launching seven rounds of missile tests this year and threatening to resume testing nuclear weapons, there's been relative calm over the last two weeks from North Korea. But with key state anniversaries coming up in the next couple of weeks and months and U.S. researchers detecting a missile launching site likely to later host intercontinental ballistic missiles, the threat from Pyongyang is as pressing as ever. To discuss the latest on the regime, we're joined by Su Kim, policy analyst at RAND Corporation and former CIA analyst. We also have Ramon Pacheco Pardo, head of department and professor of international relations at King's College London. Very warm welcome to you both. It's lovely to have you both back. And well, let's start with you, Sue. Now, We've seen new research from uh, CSIS uh, in the US, which shows that North Korea has been building a base strategically located for future ICBM launches, apparently. What is the significance of this facility and what kind of role would it play? So we know that this location is, um, it's the same province where North Korea conducted its um, January 30th IRBM. Uh, it's likely gonna house ICBMs, if not IRBMs. Um, the construction took place uh, 20 years ago. It's not yet completed. Um, they cited uh, resource constraints. Uh, but we also know, I think, that um, it's, it's also one of the 20 undeclared missile bases um, that North Korea operates. I think this shows um, persistence on the part of the North Korean regime. Um, sanctions, negotiations, diplomacy, dialogue, none of this is really going to deter the regime from achieving its ambitions. And if that hasn't been made clear, I think the, the recent uh, report, as well as um, the, the latest test where the, the North Koreans actually successively demonstrated, uh, of course, um, improved capabilities, but also um, the, 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 it's going to be more difficult for the United States and South Korea to try to intercept these missiles. So it's about lethality, and I think it's also about uh, the North Korean willpower. And now, Ramon, now North Korea made sure that there were plenty of fireworks going around back in January. And well, um, it even warned that it might break its moratorium on, on long range missiles and uh, nuclear weapons testing, of course. How far do you think it's prepared to go? Do you think we're going to see more advanced versions of the Hazong missiles? That, um, do you think it's going to fire more advanced missiles um, than its Hazong uh, 12 that it showed last month? I would imagine, right, North Korea has uh, made clear that it is going to continue to improve uh, its missile programs. It has also made clear that it's not bound uh, by the moratorium, a uh, self-imposed moratorium from a few years uh, ago. And it has uh, to test uh, these new technologies, both for technical reasons, but also, of course, because of uh, for, for political reasons, right, to send a message to the U.S., to send a message to South Korea, other countries such as uh, Japan, for example, as well. So I would expect more missile tests with new technologies being unveiled. Uh, and nuclear tests is uh, quite different. Uh, North Korea has indicated that it wants, that it wants to be treated or it wants to behave as a responsible uh, nuclear power. And responsible nuclear powers don't necessarily need to conduct new uh, nuclear tests. So I think there is a difference here. Uh, between uh, missile tests, which I think uh, North Korea will resume uh, at some point, and uh, nuclear tests, uh, which I think North Korea may not be ready yet to take such a significant step. And um, Ron, well, how worried do you think we should be about a possible resumption of a nuclear test by the North? Oh, that's to you, Ramon. Is it for me? Uh, sorry, um, I don't think uh, yeah, the question went through clearly. Um, so, Ramon, um, how, uh, what do you, how do you see the possibility of the resumption of nuclear tests by the North? Oh, yeah, sorry. So, I mean, uh, as I was indicating, I, I think this is less uh, likely uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, for political reasons, uh, Kim Jong-un declared uh, after the six nuclear tests, uh, second ICBM test of 2017, that uh, North Korea had become a nuclear power. And North Korea has tried to indicate that it is going to be a responsible uh, nuclear power. 
and responsible nuclear powers don't need to conduct more tests. And, and, and secondly, I think that would be a major step that could lead even to more sanctions being imposed by the UN Security Council, because I think this is the only circumstance under which uh, China and Russia may agree to impose new sanctions on North Korea. And North Korea may not want to take the, this step uh, to create more problems with, with China especially, but also to have more sanctions uh, being imposed and then if in the future are going to be rolled back, it would take longer, of course. And I'll see, of course, North Korea is uh, threatened that it might uh, break its self-imposed uh, moratorium on testing long-range missiles and nuclear weapons. Do you think that is what it intends to do? Well, I think Kim Jong-un has signaled um, more than once, I think, um, even, I mean, he's, North Korea has said that it's going to, it, it, it warned us that it would, it, it would break the moratorium. But I would say that from the get-go, um, when Kim Jong-un announced that he would be imposing this moratorium, um, there was no sincerity that he was going to keep it for the long run. I think he was doing it so that he would buy time um, and also buy um, credibility um, from the United States and South Korea during the negotiations. So the signaling, I think, is, is important, but I also think that looking at the intentions of the North Korean regime, um, the, the movements, the activities that we've seen so far, indicate that you know he has not been sincere from the beginning. And Sue, well, in what ways do you think that the North might uh, scale up its provocations? Uh, what key capabilities or developments should we really be looking out for? Sure. So over the last couple months, we saw a, a number of uh, missile slash projectile tests being conducted by North Korea um, of successive, I would say, um, distance and range. Uh, what is problematic, I think, is the fact that now we're not just talking about um, a longer range missile, but we're seeing North Korea uh, launch these missiles from different locations. So add to the payload, add to the range, add to the altitude. We're talking about unpredictability. And I think this is where it's, it's alarming South Korea and the United States and the broader region because, um, you know, it's one thing to be able to defend and to um, intercept the missiles. But if you don't know where it's going to be coming from, how are you going to be able to defend um, the territory? And I think that's where uh, the, the emphasis should be placed is, of course, North Korea is going to continue to demonstrate you know, this, this colorful array of, of missile technologies. But the question is, are we going to be able to respond or preempt? And Ramon, well, now there's talk of an April crisis that's impending. How does the North usually celebrate the birthday of its uh, state founder, Kim Il-sung, uh, who was born on April 15th? And well, what should we expect to see this year? I would imagine that uh, we should expect uh, a parade or new uh, missiles uh, being unveiled or new technologies uh, being unveiled. Uh, we have seen in the past, for example, North Korea conducting uh, tests trying to put satellites into orbit or what it claims are satellites uh, put them into orbit. So this type of uh, tests that may or may not cross uh, red lines, such as the UN Security Council uh, resolutions, but at the very least, uh, I would expect North Korea trying to show to the rest of the world that it has new technologies ready uh, to, as it says, uh, protect the country, right, from hostile forces, as the way North Korea uh, would put it. And I, I think uh, this will come actually interestingly after the South Korean election. We will know who the new uh, president is. I don't think this will completely change the plans of North Korea but it might try to fine tune its messaging depending on who wins, right? Because we have seen how June, the conservative candidate, he seems to be indicating that he is going to move towards uh, deterrence, uh, strengthening the alliance with the US, and he, the liberal candidate, may be indicating that he will want to, to pursue diplomacy. So this might affect the way North Korea decides to behave uh, in April before the new president is inaugurated in May. And Ramon, well, with a hundred, well, with less than a hundred days left in office, uh, President Moon seems to have accepted that there may not be a last-minute breakthrough in the inter-Korean relations, let alone an end of war declaration. So, what should South Korea's position be, or what kind of message should Mr. Moon send to the North in the remaining weeks of his presidency? 
I guess at this point, uh, the message from South Korea probably would be don't try to distort uh, the elections. Uh, we know that South Koreans don't vote uh, based on what North Korea does or doesn't do. Uh, but I would remind that President Moon uh, wouldn't want any surprises uh, during these next few weeks uh, before the election that may sway uh, the vote of some um, uh, of, the, of, of the voters in, in, in South Korea. Uh, I should also say that I think over the past few weeks and months, President Moon has been really focusing on other foreign policy issues. Uh, we saw, for example, his trip uh, to Australia that was uh, made a big splash. Uh, there is also uh, talk about potentially uh, having uh, some sort of a meeting with uh, uh, maybe potentially President Biden. This could be online. It could be part of a multilateral uh, setting. So, so I think there are different alternatives uh, for President Moon to uh, focus on foreign policy that don't involve North Korea. And I would assume that his messaging uh, to Pyongyang is going to be uh, really try to uh, keep quiet over the next few weeks until the vote takes place. And so now February 16th is the 80th birthday of Kim Jong-un's uh, late father, Kim Jong-il. And now North Korea says that it's going to celebrate um, the day in grand fashion. So what can we really expect from this birthday bash? Do you think North Korea will start testing missiles again now that the Beijing Olympics are over? So this is the 80th anniversary, um, not the 82nd, not the 86th. Um, so it's an important date for the North Koreans. Um, and and COVID-19, the sanctions, the natural disasters notwithstanding, it'll be an opportunity for Kim Jong-un to demonstrate both to the, the outside world as well as to the North Korean population that the country still remains standing strong. And I think what's problematic, of course, um, is, is to the rest of us, it's, it's, it's another way for North Korea to be confrontational. But I think also from a domestic um, perspective, um, this is only going to put greater pressure on the North Korean population to support the regime and its weapons ambitions, which also just means that there will be greater sacrifices, um, less attention to um, to, the, to the real suffering of the North Korean population. So again, a great opportunity for Kim Jong-un to maintain his mind towards the outside world, but also it's a way for him to maintain his mind towards um, his own people, I would say. And Ramon, now over the weekend, we saw the South Korean foreign minister meet with his counterparts from Japan and the US um, to really discuss these provocations from North Korea. And meanwhile, Russia and China, uh, they also held a discussion between them as well, discussing who they called their friendly neighbor. So, well, with uh, these two sort of blocks forming in terms of when it, uh, responding to North Korea, do you think there's going to continue to be this kind of divide when it comes to the global response to Pyongyang's provocations? I think so. I, I think China and Russia have made very clear that uh, from their perspective, uh, North Korea is uh, behaving responsibly and it is the fault of the US and maybe even South Korea that there are no negotiations taking place. Uh, China and Russia have also indicated that they think that the current sanctions regime is counterproductive. Uh, therefore, they are not going to support uh, the strengthening uh, of uh, the tightening of the sanctions on, on, on North Korea. Uh, and we see that the position of the U.S. especially is uh, very different, right? It says that the ball is on the North Korean court and that North Korea should accept the offer of dialogue. And I think we have seen in recent months and even the South Korean uh, position, uh, I, I think, uh, has also turned more sour uh, on uh, North Korea as there has been no progress in inter-Korean relations really for a couple of years now. So, so I think that it is true that you have these uh, two blocks uh, and I think unless uh, or until there is an assumption of, of dialogue really uh, between the two Koreas, between North Korea and the US, uh, I think we're going to see these two uh, blocks continue to, uh, continue to be in place. Well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today, so this is where we'll leave the interview. That was Sue Kim, policy analyst at RAND Corporation and former CIA analyst. We also had Ramon Pacheco Pardo, head of department and professor of international relations at King's College London. Thank you both so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.